20 years since the US-led invasion of Iraq, how has the war reshaped the country and impacted the region? And does it still affect wider world affairs today? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. 20 years ago, life in Iraq changed forever. US and British military forces rolled into the country, unleashing a wave of military destruction that would topple President Saddam Hussein. It would also kill and maim many hundreds of thousands of people. We'll be discussing with our guests the legacy of this war in Iraq, the Middle East, and globally. But first, Osama bin Javed reports from Baghdad on how the anniversary is being seen there. This is Al Firdos Square, where the famous statue of Saddam Hussein was brought down when US forces took over Baghdad. People here in the capital will tell you that in the last 20 years, all they have seen is destruction, desperation, and deep divisions. People in Baghdad have been coming to the streets and other parts of Iraq as well to try and get those rights for basic services, for jobs, for better health care, for an end to corruption, for better education, but that has not been happening for them. Uh, in the last 20 years, there is a democratic system in place, but in the last election, more than half of Iraqis did not turn up to vote. They do not believe that the politicians who are in charge really, truly represent them, and because of the high level of corruption, they feel that they have been left to suffer. Uh, also, the security situation in Iraq, as you can see, is much better than what it was, but there is this constant dread, this constant fear that what is going to happen tomorrow. Iraqis will tell you uh, that when you travel from the south, from Basra, all the way to the north, to Mosul and Erbil, that the government does not really care about them, that the government has failed them. We've heard from the Iraqi president saying that they have learned lessons from the past and they are going to try and do better in the future. The people of Iraq have gone below the poverty line. Nearly a quarter uh, of the population lives below the poverty line now, a number that has been increasing. And it is in contrast to the rising uh, foreign reserves that Iraq has, over $100 billion that it has in foreign reserves, yet basic services remain to be seen. What has happened in the last 20 years is after the US invasion, the Iraqi army was disbanded by the stroke of a pen. Then there came deep sectarian fights where tens of thousands of Iraqis were killed. And then there was the rise of ISIL. Iraq is only now beginning to come out of uh, that deep sense of insecurity. But you, when you walk in the streets, yes, there are people milling about. Uh, there is no sense of fear, especially in the federal capital. But you will, you will see and that people are still scared. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Even today, there are people who are gearing up for protests outside the parliament. And this invasion had a wider impact, not just for Iraq, but the region as well. But as the cliched saying goes, that Iraqis will tell you that, yes, the US invasion took out one Saddam Hussein, but now there is a thief in every street of Iraq. Well, from all this, let's bring in our guests into the show. We have joining us from Baghdad, Ahmed Rushdi, president of the House of Iraqi Expertise Foundation and an advisor to the former speaker of the Iraqi parliament. In Paris, Lara Marlow, Irish Times Paris correspondent who reported from Iraq extensively after the invasion in 2003. And in Washington, D.C., Bilal Wahab, an Iraq political analyst and Wagner Fellow at the Washington Institute. A warm welcome to you all. If I could start with Ahmed in Baghdad. So, 20 years on, the basic question, did the US invasion of Iraq leave the country in a better or worse place? Well, Sami, the answer of this question related to the consequences of what's happened after 2003. And it's obvious that we lost our partnership in decision-making, which caused loss of uh, political pluralism uh, ended with uh, uh, loss of social pluralism. And everyone is now thinking about his self-interest rather than the national interest. And it's obvious also that we lost something very important is the nationality, the Iraqi nationality. And all of the, those consequences, I think it's more become the responsibility of the political process, which is headed by the political blocs. And the most important thing is that the political blocs need to understand how much Iraq going in deep 
into sectarianism, uh, into more local, depending on local communities, rather than looking for all, uh, for all of Iraq. Ahmed, let me jump in there, though, and say this is what the, the advocates of the U.S. invasion would point to. They would say, hey, look, the Iraq has elections. The UNDP Human Index indicator shows life expectancy has increased since the U.S. invasion. According to other figures, GDP is higher, electricity production is up tenfold, oil production has tripled. Do those numbers tell a positive story of what life is like in Iraq? Well, it's, it's debatable. All those, well, what you talked about is debatable because as Iraqi, I, did, I don't think that electricity become well. And also there is a huge kind of, a huge percentage of unemployment. Uh, we already in the budget now announced that there is poverty uh, governorates that need uh, special items inside uh, uh, the budget. So uh, all those things that have been mentioned as an, uh, an in, uh, let's say, as a successful attempt after 2003, uh, all Iraqis need to say, well, uh, just wait for a moment. It's, it looks like it's debatable because my life is not going better. Yes, I have more money, but I, I, uh, I, I have a problem with the security situation. I have a problem with the infrastructure. And the most important thing, I lost hope in the political process in my children's future, which is a very important issue to say that Iraq can go forward on a positive uh, way. And also there is uh, another thing that needs to be managed well is that we lost our social pluralism. That means everyone is looking for his self-interest, for his community, local community in interest, the, rather than Iraq interest. And right. it shows you how much we lost hope in right. the institution, in the state it is institution. All right, let, let me take, it, let me take it that more, uh, question it's now, if I may, more for the to Bilal world. in Washington, D.C., because does Ahmed have a point when he says, you know, you've got to put some of those numbers into perspective? Because Iraq was a country that was under sanctions before the US-led invasion. It's natural to expect its GDP to increase, to expect its oil production and exporting to increase. But if you look at the bottom line for Iraqis, the Ministry of Planning in January saying the poverty rate had risen to a quarter of the population for, for an oil-rich country. Uh, good to be with you, uh, uh, Sammy. Um, I mean, the Iraq war and the, the result of the Iraq war is definitely uh, a huge elephant, and, and we can touch different parts of it. Uh, and Iraq is also a complex place, a complex country with complex societies. And let's not uh, also forget that the comparison might be also hard to make between the Saddam Hussein regime or the Ba'athist regime and the post-Saddam Hussein regime, because uh, to me, the, uh, the most uh, visible outcome uh, of the war is greater transparency. We know what goes on in Iraq. There is, there is political competition, there is openness, and there is uh, basically the absence of central command allows us to know that in detail, and of course, thanks, thanks to social media, what goes on at, at uh, several Iraqi corners, which definitely was not the case under a single man, single party control. Uh, of the Saddam Hussein regime. So perhaps, the Bilal, there, but let me uh, let me jump in uh, too and say, does that transparency sometimes show that actually the U.S.-led invasion has led to a deterioration? Take what the Borgen Project says when it talks about why there is increasing poverty in Iraq. It specifically points to as one of the main factors the U.S. invasion in 2003. The occupation in 2003, which it says has prompted a sectarian civil war, displacement of people, disruption of trade, damaging communication and transport infrastructure, and destabilizing education. Right. It's only natural if you've got all those ingredients, the cake is going to be a bad one at the end. No, that's, a, that's definitely a fair criticism. And I think there's been uh, no one more critical of the negative side of the war than, uh, than uh, you know, American press and, and uh, critics in the United States itself. But you asked earlier about the legacy of the war, and I think the, the major point is that this was an experiment in using military might for political objectives. In the case of Iraq, that was regime change. I think the change part was easy, but changing it was something better is still... Uh, that's the challenge. I hope it's still work in progress. 
But for the numbers that you, uh, the, the statistics that you mentioned, I want to refer to Iraqi agency in this. I think it's very easy and probably uh, not too hard to blame the outside forces, be it the United States or the UK, but Iraqis have a say in running their own country. I mean, I'm an Iraqi, I can say running our own country. Uh, the sectarian war was, perhaps there was a space that was created, but those were Iraqis killing each other. Uh, corruption is rampant in Iraq, but those are Iraqis stealing their own state's assets. Uh, yeah, militias run amok, uh, but those are Iraqi militias who have chosen uh, the loyalty to a neighbor rather than uh, their own country. So, yes, the Americans made tremendous mistakes, and then so did the UK, but I think they also provided the Iraqis with an opportunity, and on some aspects, those opportunities have been seized. Uh, on others, they have totally been squandered. All right. I could see Lara was shaking her head there. I take it probably in disagreement. The war, the US-led invasion gave an opportunity and to some extent it's the Iraqis who are messing it up, I guess, is, is the sentiment. What, what do you think of that, Lara? Well, I mean, for me, the, the, the invasion itself, the, the war, which lasted um, three weeks uh, and the decade that ensued, was so horrific, was such a nightmare that I don't see how anyone can argue that it was a good thing to have happened. I mean, even George W. Bush uh, has reportedly said it was a mistake. Uh, America knows it was a mistake. I mean, the cost of this war was horrific. Hundreds of thousands of people killed. You said so yourself, Sammy. Uh, 5,000 American soldiers. It's estimated to have cost the U.S. up to $3 trillion dollars. Uh, which is uh, about, uh, well, if you add that to the rest of the post 9-11 wars, which were $8 trillion altogether, you're talking about a quarter of the U.S. national debt. Um, Iraq it, is still a broken country. It's very, very corrupt. Uh, the sectarian divide uh, is, is horrendous. It was never like that un under Saddam. I'm not making excuses for Saddam. He was a brutal dictator. I, I, I agree to that. But going in and breaking the country, destroying the country, uh, was not a way to save it, and it, it hasn't saved it. All right, let me come back, uh, if I may, to Bilal and say, is there really no way around Bilal, if one is honest, to say that invading a country, right, without UN backing, is a very, to put it mildly, is a very crude way of managing a transition to democracy, right? You, of course, communities are going to be armed by all kinds of actors, vacuums are created, and people go at each other's necks. That is not the ideal sort of transition to democracy in which you could say, right. well, you know, we gave them the chance, but they didn't really seize it. Was it much of a chance in those kinds of circumstances? Look, that is fair. But uh, I go back to my to my point. I think Iraqis have agency. We we cannot look at a country of 40 million and and uh, you know uh, have like four million uh, barrels, five million barrels of oil a day uh, with a history and culture and basically say everything and anything wrong that goes on uh, at that country uh, is basically America's fault. Right. Uh, America made tremendous mistakes, and as I said, the Americans would be the first to, uh, to uh, name those mistakes. But how did the Iraqis seize this opportunity? Uh, and then the, the question of comparing it to Saddam Hussein, as I said, uh, that's probably not a fair comparison because we just know too much about the post-Saddam than, than the pre-Saddam. But uh, I, I said, it's a, it's a big elephant. Maybe uh, for some towns that were away from Saddam Hussein's wrath, Okay. Uh, the instability that ensued after was bad news. But look, I lived five years of my childhood in a refugee in a refugee camp, and my only crime was uh, being a Kurd or living in Kurdistan. Neither neither of them being my choice. All right. So, let, uh, let me bring in again. It's in the let me bring in, if I may, Ahmed Rushdie from uh, Baghdad. Ahmed, who are the biggest winners of this conflict? Many would argue. Number one, Iran. Number two, armed groups like Al Qaeda, ISIL, which didn't have much of a strong presence before the U.S. invasion. Did it entrench these people, these actors? Well, there are so many winners for what's happening to Iraq, uh, inside and outside. Uh, the political blocks, first of all, that it looks like in front of Iraqis, they are the biggest winners, because we all know how much corruption made money for them. This is the first issue. The second issue is that 
the, also there are regional winners who are seeing Iraq, uh, the, the, the fate of Iraq in, 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 the, in, the, in the next 10 years. Uh, and for example, Iraq in 2030, as Minister of Planning saying that we're going to be 50 million or more than 50 million, so more than 50 million with a huge kind of, of, of uh, energy uh, reserve, but also we have a problems with water. And we are now seeing dryness is the major threat for Iraqis. And it looks like the, this problem has be, become bigger and bigger day by day, time by time, and with no real solution. And all we, what the political blocs is doing is blaming Turkey and Iran. That's it. So you can imagine is that those political blocs, blocs inside this political process does not have a real roadmap for the future of Iraq. So this is what people actually made, the, made themselves saying to themselves is that why we should participate in such a political process. So you can imagine in one example, which is dryness, that suffer is, uh, uh, Iraq is suffering from, actually made a question mark for the, pol for the fate of the political process in the mind of Iraqis. So who, is, who are the winners? Everyone uh, 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 concerning winner, uh, except the Iraqi people. So that's why we are seeing the help of the international community in a way or another. It's one of the saving boats for Iraqis because the international community knows exactly what are the problems, knows exactly who is responsible for those problems and need to be managed. And those problems need to be managed internationally because they are all responsible for what's happened in 2000. All right, Ahmed, sounds like what we're getting at, what you're getting at is a lack of um, international engagement and order in this. And I, I wonder, Lara, was the war a key milestone in undermining the international order and underscoring the principle that, hey, if you're a big power, you can just go ahead, invade and occupy a country without any UN backing? Absolutely. And the proof of that is that uh, Vladimir Putin today says over and over and over, look what the Americans did in Iraq, look what the Americans did in Kosovo. They went into both countries without a UN mandate. And, and he says he's just doing the same thing the Americans did in, in Kosovo and Iraq. And in, in a way, he's right. Uh, so it's become, it created a very dangerous precedent. Um, regarding the, the water shortage in Iraq, I mean, it is a fact that, that uh, Recep I, um, Erdogan is, Tayyip Erdogan, is building huge dams on the Tigris and the Euphrates, which are depriving the Iraqis of their water. Um, one of you used the word agency, said the Iraqis have more agency, but they don't. I mean, the fact that more than half of them won't even bother to vote, uh, the political power has been captured uh, by these sort of warlords, basically, by corrupt political groups, uh, many of them uh, in uh, obeisance to Iran. Iran definitely won the war. I mean, Iraq in some ways is almost a colony of, of Iran now, and it's, it's quite incredible that the United States of America, which views Iran as, as, a, as an adversary, um, it basically handed Iraq to Iran on a platter. And I think the biggest losers are the, are the Sunni Muslims, uh, because they, they basically ran Iraq before, and they have been persecuted uh, since the invasion. They lost the most people during the civil war of the, of the 2000s. Uh, and the, the Kurds are semi-autonomous in Kurdistan. Uh, the Shia have most of the power, most of the resources. Uh, so Iraq Sunnis are, are, are orphaned by this war. All right. It's interesting, Lara mentioned there the issue of Ukraine. And we, as we know, recently the ICC issued an arrest warrant for Russia's President Vladimir Putin. Now, earlier I spoke to the president of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and I put the question to him of accountability for what's happened in Iraq and whether we'll see powerful countries face that kind of accountability. Critics also ask, will we see the day when the ICC can issue arrest warrants or indictments for some of the, the most powerful countries in the world, some of whom have been accused, it's been documented by human rights groups, have 
of what they call flagrant violations of international humanitarian law, according to a statement by Amnesty International, March 28, 2017, referring to the U.S.-led coalition airstrikes in Mosul, which they say destroyed houses and families. Is the day going to come when we might see the ICC get involved with those kinds of cases? So the scope of the jurisdiction of the court is strictly provided for in the statute. If the court has the jurisdiction, um, I, mean, I mean not only in respect to the territory, but also in respect to the persons committing, uh, committed, uh, allegedly comm committing crimes, but also in respect of the time. You know, I I I cannot I cannot uh, speak for the prosecutor. He is the independent organ of the court, and he has to make selection of situation and cases uh, for the before before the, the the court. You know, the court is not able to to deal with all atrocities all over the world. This one court is eighteen judges, and there's a lot of 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 atrocities. And on, on, on all continents. So the prosecutor must do um, the selection of, of cases um, and, and prosecute uh, according to, to his um, conviction that um, this is the proper way, proper, proper thing to do. So some difficult questions of legacy and accountability. Bilal, in Washington, D.C., what has the war done in terms of the image of the U.S. and the Western allies after all of that legacy. We'll remember, of course, the Abu Ghraib incident, the way that prisoners were treated and shown uh, chained and piled on top of each other, the whole Blackwater killings, the WikiLeaks videos showing U.S. air crews gunning people, including journalists, and laughing about it and so on. Has that been a huge irrecoverable setback to the idea of the West promoting democracy, human rights around the world, and rule of law? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I think it, it also totally undermined this might makes right, uh, this legacy of, of uh, military solutions to uh, political problems, for sure. Uh, and and um, I mean, even in the U.S. political rhetoric, you saw that uh, um, basically Clinton, Hillary Clinton, was trying very hard to make sure that you know people forget that she voted for the Iraq War and Obama became president in part because he was against the war. So there is this conventional wisdom that what happened in Iraq was a mistake, that war of choice. But going back to the Iraqi side, uh, yes, they suffered the brunt of these. Uh, uh, mistakes and miscalculations. But at the end of the day, they were handed a country. And uh, going back to the question of agency, uh, yes, there is corruption. And yes, there is militia. And uh, these two are in a dirty entanglement that invites Iranian interference. Uh, it undermines Iraq's potential. But the Iraqis are waking up because the past is the past. And uh, the Iraqis realize that, you know, the country that made all of those mistakes, being the United States, cannot be also relied on exclusively and solely uh, to fix their own problems. These are new Iraqi problems that scream for an Iraqi solution. Yes, the turnout in elections are low, but in 2019, uh, young Iraqis who have no memory or recollection of Saddam Hussein fled the streets and at cost of, of treasure and, and, and blood managed to force a prime minister to resign. I think that's agency for you. And I was just uh, at a conference in, uh, in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan at the American University there. Well, having an American university is quite a change. But those young minds were basically asking, how can we, Iraqis, uh, chart a better future for, uh, for themselves rather than rely on you know, the balance of power or great power competition? What is it that Iraqis themselves can do? All right, hang on. Let, let me bring in Ahmed. That, that's a good point. I like that point, Bilal. But Ahmed, what can Iraqis do? Aren't they really up against not only a disinterested international community, to put it, you know, in the, in the mildest terms, but also an entrenched political class that doesn't want to see change? I mean, this is a country with a petrodollar budget of around $152 billion, and yet it struggles with the provision, as you pointed out, of basic services like electricity and ranks at towards the bottom of Transparency International's Corruption Index, 157 out of 180 countries. 
Well, Sami, after 2003, with the new political process, the consequences of this political process made a rock called the political blocks. Now, all the young men and women tried to smash this rock, and they failed. Because now, today, those political blocks negotiating changing the electoral law, which that bring the independent MPs to the parliament and make a new parliament in 2020 after October elections 2022. So you can imagine how people are desperate because this rock is not smashed anymore. And that's why I'm asking for the, or Iraqis are asking actually, for some sort of collaboration of the international community. Start to help Iraq to rehabilitate this political process that happened after 2000. Right, that's a good point. And hang on, like Ahmed, hang on, because I, I like that point. I want to take it to Mara, though, Iraq. Uh, you know, the calls for more international engagement. It seems almost like the Iraq, the, uh, Iraq war, Lara, and the US invasion of Iraq was a turning point for US interest, engagement, and influence in the Middle East, right? Subsequent administrations either talked about the pivot towards Asia, or, or talked about America first and a more inward-looking policy? Would that be a right, a correct description? Yes, well, there, there are many pieces to the story. I mean, the, the failure of the collapse of, of Libya, basically, with the, the killing of, of Muammar Gaddafi, and Libya is still in, in crisis, still in conflict. Uh, the civil war in Syria. I mean, I, I think that the the age of the of the dictators of Gaddafi and Assad, the father and and now the son and and of uh, Saddam Hussein, it, it it was bad and and people had no freedom and and they were terrorized by their governments. But I think that the instability that we see across the region today, uh, coupled with the most far right wing, extreme right wing Israeli government, uh, and the total uh, just forgotten. Of the, of the Palestinians, the Palestinians are, are, are just completely abandoned by the, the international community with no hope of their own state anymore. I think the whole region is in a terrible, terrible state, and I don't think the world is watching. The world is watching Ukraine and Russia and, and China, uh, including the Americans. And, and, and I think that it's, it's tragic. Uh, I think it's criminal. I think that George W. Bush and, and um, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and, and the neocons at the Pentagon, uh, Wolfowitz and, and company, those people should be in The Hague, uh, along with Vladimir Putin. They should have been indicted for war crimes. I mean, if, if you'd seen what I saw, people, dozens, hundreds of civilians killed by, uh, by, by uh, cluster bombs and, and shot at checkpoints and, and people being tortured in Abu Ghraib. Um, it, it's it's just inexcusable. And uh, yes, the region is 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 in a terrible, terrible state. Um, I mean, remember that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu back in 1996 uh, did a report called "A Clean Break," where he advocated the invasion of Iraq. And the idea, the Americans were terribly naive about all this. They thought the, the Middle East was made of good guys and bad guys, and if you got rid of the bad guys, everyone would live happily ever after. Right. And, and that just hasn't happened. Right. All right. I'm afraid we are out of time. So we're going to have to thank our guests for their great contributions to the show. We appreciate all of you, Ahmed Rujdi, Lara Marlow, and Bilal Wahab. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now, it's goodbye.